Okay. Good morning, all. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, excellent, good. Um, so I'm Peter. I work at Deloitte Digital as a tech lead. And uh, I spent 20 years of my life, more than 20 years, in software delivery. And during this time, there was only one question that I've been asked more than any other question. And that is of, when will it be done? And this applies for a task or for a release or for a project. I believe that we live in a world of DDD, and I, and I wish that this would be a good DDD, the domain-driven design. But what I mean, that I think we live by a world driven by dates, so date-driven development. We as humans seem to like crave certainty, and somehow we associate certainty with a date. And most often than not, we are rather being wrong um, than being uncertain. And I think there are a couple of ways to deal with that. One is to try to avoid these questions, try to avoid answering this question. And second way is to embrace it. But embracing it by working, by creating a work system that allows answering this question as easily as possible and as accurate as possible. The rest of the talk is about the latter. So if you have a way of avoiding this question, please do so. I would highly recommend it. I failed to, to achieve that. But if you don't, I have a way to, to avoid this question, then maybe this talk will, will help you. This is a case study. So what we've done is we have, um, I'm going to take you through a journey of a real project uh, that Nilo Digital we undertook. And we, I'm going to take you to steps of transformations that allowed us to genuinely change our way of working. I must stress, though, we have not invented a new method of work. This is not a new methodology. This is just a way that we took elements that from various um, practices, if you wish, to help us deliver software better. So the journey started with uh, rocking up all this client. Uh, so it was a central government client. As a way of context, we had about nine teams uh, geographically dispersed ac across three locations. And we took out from our toolbox what we knew best. And this is probably recognized as Scrum. So we don't Scrum fairly well. We've done all the ceremonies Scrum set. Um, and I was quite proud of that. And we had um, quite, a, quite a good success. And um, we've done a lot of this. You may recognize the planning poker cards. We've done a lot of planning poker. This is actually my personal set of decks that I used to carry with me. I was very proud of them. And I used to play a lot of poker with my teammates. And we used a lot of story points. Some of these might recognize it. And um, we based a lot of our plans based on story points. So we try to somehow answer the question of when will it be done, somehow translating story point using some magic averages or kind of burns up and, and give, give, give a day to a cl client. And the problem with story points was that every time I tried to explain a client or even some of the new team members, this was the reaction that, that I got, like, like really. Uh, I was recently in, in a, as a, at a, at a um, training or data forecasting where where there were a number of um, real experienced um, agilists, I would call. And even in the room, we disagreed whether a story points represent complexity or duration or combination of both. So how to be a better way of doing this software? We, we had to go away from, from, from having, um, using these old ways of working and trying to come up with an answer to what needs to be done that will be most, of, most often not inaccurate. And the genesis of our new ways of working was uh, Dan Vacanti's book. I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, in the meantime, um, Dan became a good personal friend of mine as well. But we used the, some of his, some of his um, ideas from the book to change our way we work. So what we've done is we moved away from Scrum, Story Points, Sprints. We moved away from it. And we looked at trying to focus on predictability. And we looked at unpredictability as being caused by the lack of flow. So therefore, we moved um, our view, our attention to flow, where we look at flow as a movement of value to a process. So by measuring the flow, by capturing uh, three simple metrics, we tried and we managed to improve the flow. And once we have improved the flow, then we are on good solid ground for forecasting. So very much moved away from a prescriptive method of working to one based on measurement and observation, improved ways of working, and then when you are to, to achieve predictability, and when you achieve predictability, then you used forecasting. 
Now, I must also uh, caveat it. Predictability is important, but it's not always achievable. So that's a different talk. But for most type of work we are doing, predictability can be achieved. So I'm going to take you through a journey. Um, and I'm going to rush through this a bit. Uh, this is usually a kind of 40 to 50 minutes talk. I'm um, try to condense it in half an hour. So hope you want me to rush. So before I'm going to take you to the steps we took, I'm going to show you the very end state. So the very end state was a simple one pager that had two dates, a plan date, a forecasted date. I forecasted with the confidence level, so how sure we are on that forecast. And a simple delta between, sorry, oh, simple delta between the forecasted and plan date. And that was a simple page that we created, but a lot of hard work that went into creating that simple uh, uh, project status page. OK, so let me do a number of steps. Step number one, we have um, defined the Kanban system. And a Kanban system is a system based on queuing uh, theory, so the queuing system, and items arrive and something departs. So hopefully items, ideas come to your system and working software departs. So this is the world's simplest Kanban. You have a to-do in progress and done, and you items flow through that. You can have different type of issues. Uh, you can track stories, defects, ideas, whatever it's what, what they would like to do. We, we track uh, mainly user stories. That was our main uh, measurement, um, main, main issue type they track. You can also group uh, the issue types per releases or any other way you want to kind of group them in swim lanes. So one thing we've done is, is um, we have created, the way we created our Kanban system, that we have interjected between any work column, a, a weight column, or a queue column. So Kanban by default is, is works really well if you implement a pool system. So the item should be pulled downstream as opposed to pushed upstream. Having a column between the work items, a queue column, that was very easy to achieve that. As an example, if I'm a developer, I would have a column saying development in progress. I would have the issue with me. I would do the development. When I'm done, I'm moving into development in progress, which is a work column, into development done, which is a queue column. I'm taking my avatar off. I'm going to away do something else. What happens then with capacity downstream, as a tester has capacity, they would pull the system in work tray and put the testing in progress, do their testing. When it's done, maybe to testing done and so on and so forth. So a little trick that helps greatly to achieve the pool-based system. Step number two. What we've done is we have defined our work in progress. As I said, our method, our ways of working was very much based on measurement. Before we measure anything, we have to kind of define what we're measuring it. And that was, the, that was our work in progress, the, the boundary, defining the boundary of, of, of our work. So what we've done is that made a very clear distinction, for instance, between the backlog, which we've seen as a promise that one day somebody might be pick up those items to kind of work our Kanban system. So items in the backlog were absolutely idle, no work was happening. We work happened only on our Kanban. Yeah? So we want to make sure that every work is happening is being measured. By the way, you, you can't uh, link up multiple Kanban systems, so you don't have to necessarily be from backlog into a Kanban. You can multiple Kanbans that you can chain together. But very importantly, you want to say that work starts here and ends there. So again, it goes back to, to the kind of a queuing system. So items arrive and they depart. And in our case, items arrive from Kanban. They went through the system. We done analysis. We have done development. We have done testing. And then we have deployment to production and working software departed uh, the system. The Kanban looked like this. So we always combine digital with, with physical. I'm a great believer of, of if you're in the same room, um, physical artifacts are much better than, than digital ones. And the delimitation work in progress look like this. So what we had here, you don't see here on the left hand side, this column just indicate how many items we have left in the backlog. Um, they were not visible on the work in progress. And then the workflow, so my microphone just fell off. I will try to put it back. Um, yes, you can help me a bit, and then I'll move on. So yes, yeah, so we made a very clear demarcation. So in essence, what happened is that if the post-it was on the wall, work, you did not recognize that, that work. Yeah? So you have to show that the, the work that was agreed that is on our work in progress. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just try that. I'm sorry. If not, I can hold it. If I'm not that strong for some reason. Okay, okay. right, thank you. Right, uh, step number three. 
so what we've done is now, so now we've defined what we're measuring. What we've done is we have uh, measured three simple metrics. One is cycle time, throughput, and the work in progress. So cycle time is, is, is a elapsed time it takes an item expressing calendar days to traverse your working system. So from the first column to the, to the, to the last one, part of your work in progress. Throughput is the how many items on a given time period, weekly or monthly or fortnightly, you eject from the system. So how many are got done? And work in progress is just the number of items that are in, in the, on the board. This work system uh, is, is a queuing system and is, is, uh, and is defined by Lucas Law. So Dr. Little, an MIT professor, has uh, looked at queuing system and he defined the relationship be between these three metrics. So Dr. Little said that average cycle time equals average work in progress divided by average throughput. Really important to call out the fact that this formula holds water only if you look into the past. It cannot and shouldn't be used for forecasting. So the one thing we, we can see is that um, to reduce cycle time, and by the way, why is it important to recycle time? It's important because only then you get the feedback that you want. If you define well your work in progress, sorry, your work system, then it means that the cycle time if you, means how many days it takes, for instance, to get something deployed to production or to get something from, from the tester. What you want to do is to reduce the cycle time because that's when you get the rich feedback, whether it's working as expected or not. So to reduce the cycle time, there are two ways to do that. Increase the throughput or reduce work in progress. It's extremely hard to increase your throughput overnight. Suddenly, you're not going to find speed that takes you two or three times going faster than you won yesterday. So the easiest way you can reduce cycle time is by reducing the work in progress. So this is the... This is one of the things that I work with team managers or team leads is to instill trust that actually putting less work in the Kanban is beneficial as opposed to putting more to work. And this is something I struggle with the clients as well. They always say, well, working all this item at the same time, surely all important, and they don't, they don't realize the damage they do, actually make the system go slower. More work in the system, unless you can find more throughput, the longer it takes to traverse. Yeah? And this applies to anything, not just software. It can be of any kind of work item you are um, tracking. So step number four, we started visualizing it. Now, so we defined what we're measuring, we defined the measurement ways, and now we started to do the visualization. So what we've done is, um, the first visualization was using scatter plots. So what we've done is we have, it's very easy, these graphs on horizontal, you have time, on the vertical, you have the cycle time. A dot appears on a scatter plot when it leaves the system. Yeah? So when, a, when, a, when you have done the item, left your working system, then you put it on a scatter plot, and you put on the y-axis the cycle time it took an item to complete. So an item that took less time, it will be closer to the, to the x-axis. One that took long time, it will be somewhere out there. And once you kind of plot those things in, into your scatter plot, you can do something quite interesting now. So suddenly you can say, well, let me count my items. And you can count, for instance, 50% of items, and then draw a line and see what the cycle time for the topmost 15% item. You can do, and this made up example, 15 days. I, um, and what, I can tell me, what, can, what it tells me, factually correct, that 50% of my items took 15 days or less. And this is the first question that you can answer. How long will it take to complete? Well, for one item, I have very high confidence, sorry, okay, if I, for instance, count 85% of my items, I'm fairly confident that any item you give me, it will take 32 days or less. So this is, this is something that two things uh, happens. One is, one is um, I know something about my system, and second, I can answer a question quite cheaply, how long an item takes to complete. This is a exactly um, this is a real scatter plot from from the project, um, and in our case, I think 85% of item took 27 days or less for the time period I've selected. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So so with the scatter plot, I can do two things. I can do qualitative analysis, as in I can count how many items I have and how long it takes to complete, and also I can do quali um, qualitative uh, quantitative 
qualitative was before, and I can do quantitative analysis. So I can look into that one. I can look at trends such as this. So if I have, uh, this is my real project, and I can see my cycle time ever increasing, I can look at it and try to understand whether is that a pattern that I cannot get away with it, or is a pattern that I should do something about it. So if this is a start of a project, then probably it's fine because the system is kind of ramping up. You have to prime the system. You expect cycle time to increase and then to stabilize. But if this is not a ramping on project, what will happen then if this trend is being um, preserved, then your cycle time will increase. It will take longer and longer and longer to, to complete. So then I have data, and I can look into each dot, in essence, represent if you need this instance, a Jira ticket, for instance. I can go, go into the Jira ticket, I can look at the history and understand why things happened and try to avoid that. Again, uh, another kind of analysis I can do, I can look at these two clusters, for instance. So I can see something happened there that suddenly took longer to complete and something that took less to complete. Again, this, this tool it cannot be used to prevent it because remember the dot appears on the scatter plot only, only the f um, after the item has been completed. But I can still go back to that cl red cluster, understand what were those items, what has caused that to take longer, and try to avoid those type of patterns to, to happen in the future. Conversely, reducing cycle time, while on the face of it, it could be good news, it could be caused by weekends and overnight. Again, you want to make sure that you understand your system because I'm going to touch upon later on, we're going to use the data from the past for the forecast of the future. What you don't want to do is, is to create new forecasts that you baked in a lot of wo work um, weekends and overnight. Step number five, um, what we've done is we have introduced a replenishment ceremony. So now we had our backlog, we had a work in progress. We had to find a mechanism of bringing items in from the backlog into the, into the system. Now, a replenishment ceremony is not, not dissimilar to a, a scrum planning, but it's not identical. So first of all, teams, they could create their own cadences uh, when they have these ceremonies. Most often than not, they have it weekly, but you could have it twice per week or even fortnightly. And secondly, there are two questions that we, we tend to ask in this ceremony that a scrum doesn't ask. One is that just in time prioritization, and trust in time commitment. So what we want to do that is we want to look at the backlog and see, pick one item and ask ourselves, is this the right thing to work on? If it is, we're considering it. If not, pick something else. And the second is, is about the right sizing. And this is the right sizing question is the SLA that we are taking for clients or product owners saying that we commit to bring this item in, to complete this item in a given SLA. And the way we take the SLA comes from scatter plot. So again, we show the data. So we go in the replenishment session with the data. We look at the product owner and say, OK, what confidence level do you want to give for this item you're looking holding in my hand? If you're a gambler, you can do 50-50. You can take 50% uh, confidence level. But 85 is, is typically a, a good confidence level for one item. And what we do is then we look at 85 confidence percentile. And we said, OK, for this period in the past, it took 27 days or less to, to complete. And then what we do is we ask the team, do we think, can we complete this item in 27 days or less? If the answer is yes, we commit to, a, we commit to product owner, to the client, that yes, we take this item and complete it. If the answer is no, we pause. If you knew up front there's a strong likelihood you're going to miss the SLA, you might not consider whether you're bringing it into your work system or not. And quite often, we find ourselves that we could not build this um, item in that given uh, cycle time because of the dependency. Maybe somebody else had to do something, and we knew it takes more than 27 days or less. Then you have some very simple tools to say, well, actually, I'm not picking it just yet. I'll wait another week to see if that dependency has moved. Conversely, if the item is too big, so for instance, if, if I, I picked an uh, epic, for instance, opposed to a story, then we kind of break it down uh, up to a point that we get an item that we feel confident that we can build in 27 days or less. Then <coughs> the next question to ask ourselves, how many of these items we bring in? Uh, and to achieve that, we, we've looked at preservation of flow. So what we want to do is we want to match the departure rate with the, with the arrival rate. So again, it goes back to a little slow. 
Remember, we don't want to increase uh, artificial the work in progress because that will impact our cycle time. So what we do is, again, we go in these replenishment sessions, we have the data about the throughput, and if the session is weekly, we know, for instance, that we had the last three, four, four weeks, we had about four items per week we, we got done. Then what we aim to do that is to put a whip limiter on the first column uh, to four and say the aim is of the session is to leave the, the, um, the ceremony with four items on the board. If I had went in a session having already one item, I brought three more, or if I had four items in the session, the session would cancel. It means that we had enough in the work system that we don't want to add more items to it. Step number uh, six. Um, how long timing wise? There's no timer here. Ten, ten, ten minutes? Good, thank you. Um, so, okay, so now we have a way of bringing items in. Um, we made a commitment to a client. Now, the commitment means that we have to do our utmost not to break it. Yeah? So, how do we know whether we are breaking or not a commitment? Well, we can monitor the aging items in our work system. So, every time an item spends a day on in, a, in a work in progress, it ages by one day. So if you remember, we said that uh, in our case, uh, this example says 85 percentile says 34 days or less. What we have here now on the horizontal representation of our Kanban, our exact work system, so we have next, analysis, sign off, and so on and so forth. And there are a number of dots that are on the green area. They're absolutely fine. They're progressing through. They're not done yet, but they're progressing through, but they haven't really aged that bad, so that means that there's a very strong likelihood that our SLA is going to be met. But some of them, if we see them, they highlight them, them here, they are either at risk or actually even has, have missed the timeline for the SLA. So for instance, the very first one, that one has spent 15 days in the work system and hasn't even moved one, one, one centimeter. So that item is definitely at risk of not being completed in, in a given SLA. And that is really useful information because then the teams can use the stand-ups to make sure that they are working on the most appropriate items. It's always tempting to say that you're always working on items at the far right, but that's not much right, actually. Um, it's much better to work on the, or to focus on items which are at risk. Okay, number seven, what we've done is um, we introduced whip limiters right across the board. So step one was to introduce a whip limiter at the beginning of our Kanban, but that's not enough to achieve flow. You need to introduce a whip limiter right across the board. And what we've done is we have grouped together um, uh, related uh, um, columns, for instance, analysis in progress, analysis done had one whip limit, uh, dev in progress dev done had the other one, and so on and so forth. Now how you set these whip limits is, uh, we use a bit of theory of constraint uh, element to kind of start off to see what other limits that we can use, but frankly, that's, don't worry about it. Set some limits and see whether they're working or not and change them. Only one thing I would say, once you set a limit, don't just break it because it just you feel like it. Just see, run it for a number of weeks, a week or two, and then adjust it and set a new rule and kind of follow the new rule until you, you have um, achieved a, a good um, limitation of work in progress. Why is that important? Well, it is important because we want to build slack in the system. Remember, we talked about flow. To achieve flow, we don't want to have 100% resource utilization. We want to optimize for flow. So it means that at any given time, we want people to be free to look at unexpected. So for instance, if I have three developers, uh, as a rule of thumb, I like to create a whip limit that only two would be busy at any given time. So one is always free, either to pair up uh, or to look at, um, to look at uh, help a behavior analysis or a tester and so on and so forth. So building Slack is really important to achieve flow. Uh, using whip limits is one way to do that. Uh, step number eight was we used curative flow diagrams to um, look at um, the entire flow and also to validate the impact of our actions. I'm going to zoom through it briefly. Um, so I'll give you some examples. So curative flow diagram, in essence, it shows the progression in time of items and how they transition from, uh, in this example, next analysis development, so on and so forth. So how they transition in time and contains all the elements I talked about. 
So the arrival rate is, is this line. So these are the number of items arriving in the system. Departure rate was this line, how many items left my work in progress. Uh, the cycle time is kind of the distance between the, that line and that line, and the work in progress is, is that. So we can, any given time, I can see, for instance, if my average work in progress is, is it being stable or not. Okay, um, this is a real cumulative flow diagram. I'm going to skip it because I'm running out of time. I'm happy to talk to you after if you're interested. So we have flow managed. Um, then we have a more predictable system, and we are on forecasting on solid ground. Okay. So again, we can go back to the question of when will it be done, but not at item level. It's more like a collection of items, typically a release. And then in this instance, kind of this, how, uh, this, this question comes to, to flavors. Um, how long will it take knowing the number of items in a start date or I will start and target date how many items I can squeeze in. For both questions, the method works. So the forecasting we've done using the uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So uh, Monte Carlo simulations are used to model um, probability outcomes of systems that are hard to predict due to variable uh, r random inputs. That's the big definition. A simpler one is the, find the one I found from the book is the simplest analogy is that when you're going on the ladder, first thing you do is bombarding your ladder with random forces to see how stable it is, you don't want to fall. In the same vein, you will build the forecasting model and you bombard with random values to see how stable it is. Okay, this doesn't work. Okay, fine. So, um, MC simulation is extremely simple, uh, hard to explain, it's extremely, extremely simple, it has only four steps. You define the domain of possible inputs, then you pick randomly value from the domain of possible inputs, perform a computation, aggregate results. In a software world, the domain of possible inputs in our case was the daily throughput, how many items are got done. Then we done a random of thousands of simulations. Each simulation was taken a number from the past, uh, done a computation, and um, aggregate the results, and produced a, a um, histogram and I'll show you in a second. So, sorry, I have to click that. So again, we use a tool for this. We haven't done it manually. Uh, I probably can't do it manually because you need a thousands of, of, of simulations to happen. The domain of possible inputs were the, uh, was the um, or throughput. So the top part of the graph shown how many items you got done every day. And you can see some days we've done none, some days we've done 10, some days we've done one. Then also we started a start date. So we want to start from that date and add it a value of how many items I want to deliver, um, build. So a small video, hope it's gonna work. So what you do is, um, you have the data. So that's the past data. Remember, we measured our system. Then you say you want to start from whatever date is I can read it, and I want to simulate how long will it take to complete <coughs> 75 items. There are some trials, and then the outputs are in the bottom histogram. And what it tells me that, for instance, 70% of the trial finished on 21st of November, 85 on 30th of November, and so on and so forth. Now again, remember, what we're doing is using the past uh, to, to predict the future. So if my, I, can, I still have to have apply judgment, what is the most representative data sample I can use, and I can drag my, my, my lines to exclude some data set, for instance, exclude the overnights, yeah, or, uh, or exclude uh, big holiday periods, and run new simulations, and I get new dates. So these are a lot of what we call what if scenarios. And I used to do with teammates and teammates used to do themselves. So you can do a lot of simulation literally in, in the space of minutes. We've done two simulations in the space of a minute here. This is goes back to building a work system where you can answer this question as cheaply as humanly possible. Okay, so uh, around time, only one slide actually, one pager. This was started from, well, this forecast came oh, from the simulation. So a lot of hard work behind uh, ended up with one pager. Sometimes the news was bad, but something happens. And um, thank you, I ran out of time. Thank you very much for your time.